Hello, everybody. Welcome to Instrumental Breakthroughs. I am your host, Daniel Shank, and I'm really happy that you're here. Um, Instrumental Breakthroughs is a project of TAM integration. We offer psychedelic integration and preparation coaching all over the world. And if you would like to see more about what we do, you can go to tamintegration.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can go to tamintegration.com slash donate. We would also like to thank Brian from Deadheadland, who is uh, co-produces the show and graciously allows us to uh, use this platform. You can visit Deadheadland at deadheadland.com and they also have a Patreon page. And so today uh, I'm happy you're here and I'm really happy to introduce my guest who is sort of over time become one of my favorite um, keyboard players. And, you know, if I, if I think back about it, has sort of been almost, he's been the keyboard player from the soundtrack of my life for the past several years. You know, there've just been so many shows at Terrapin, be it at brunch or 420 or in the evening and outside when the weather is perfect or playing alongside Phil with like, you know, some sort of very special Terrapin or something like that. And you know, there is, there's Scott um, jamming right along. And so, you know, thanks for, thanks for playing that role in my life. And thanks for being here today. Man, that's so great to hear. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. I think we even, you know, we did a Passover too, perhaps. That were yeah. really nice. <laughs> that's always fun at Terrapin for sure. Yeah. Well, it's always really fun when you get the great room and there's, you know, 50 people in it. Yeah. It's really cool. When you actually... You know, I have long limbs, so it's yeah. nice when I can move them without banging into 20 people. Yeah. Flail about, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah, I, I, I need to get my flail on. <laughs> um, so the theme of the show really is how do psychedelics inspire us to be who we are? And there's a lot of science going on these days. You know, in, you can open up Forbes magazine and they're talking about how um, plant medicine, psilocybin, MDMA are helping people with trauma and PTSD heal. Um, I don't feel like there are enough articles about how psilocybin, MDMA, LSD and the like are helping health, healthy people kind of reach amazing heights of creativity and arts and magic. And so I'm just really curious if you would share with us maybe a story or two about how these sacred substances have transformed you into this radiant being that we are beholding in this moment. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I, hope that's, I hope that's even partially true. Um, yeah, well, so I got, you know, to go back to the beginning, um, I've been, you know, music's been in me all my life, literally. I, I, um, I can't remember not, you know, sort of being obsessed with music, that sort of being the center of my life, even as a, I have, I have really early memories of, that go back to probably about um, two and a half, three years old. Um, and a lot of it involves, you know, playing with my xylophone, playing with my toy piano. Um, mm -hmm. And then by the time, um, I moved um, into from from an apartment into a house with my with my parents. Um, we had gotten a piano, um, and at that point, I was probably about four years old, and that piano was just in my my life. You know, it's just something I did every day. It's uh, um, I wasn't taking lessons until I was much older, but it was it was just something that you know, you know. It, um, you know, it's funny how life is. You just live it, you know? So I didn't mm -hmm. see it as anything odd. It just was a part of my life. And, you know, it's not like I didn't even give it much thought, you know, when I, you know, when I wasn't eating or, you know, doing, <laughs> you know, doing stuff I had to do and just sit down at the piano and, and play around. It was, it was my thing to do. I guess as other kids may have played with other toys or whatever, it was, it was kind of a toy to me. Although I don't think I ever looked at it so much as, as, fun per se it's something a little bit different unique um and uh but whatever it was yeah i really i really enjoyed it and i really enjoyed occupying my time with it so mm -hmm. that being the case i was always a musician i've always loved music i've listened to the radio early on and you know my my, my parents always 
always used to remind me when I was older that, you know, I knew all the words and I was always mm. on key and I could sing along to everything. And that. so, yeah, just kind of, you know, obsessed with music, really, really into it. And um, so at some point, um, I, I, well, I, you know, it's, it's going to go back to really when I first started smoking marijuana, I all of a sudden, I was into rock and roll. I understood that some musicians smoke marijuana and, uh, you know, it all of a sudden clicked for me when I started smoking it, that this is, there's a whole uh, part of, of music or, you know, something in my brain that I was unable to tap into until now, until I started getting high. I'm hearing music differently. I'm hearing the separation of instruments clearly. Um, and I'm coming up with, you know, ideas of my own and I'm being inspired to just by listening to music and all this is like, it's, it's, it's huge, a huge step from just where I was, you know, tinkering around to, mm -hmm. you know, oh, this is, a, this is art, you know, I, you know, I really get this and it's an art form. And, um, so I became pretty interested in. And of course, this is, you know, that at this point, I'm a teenager, it's the height of the war on drugs. And I became pretty interested in this idea that, you know, just like you were talking about, just marijuana can take you to uh, a, a, a place where for me, and I presume for everybody else, if they were open to it, could make music on a better and deeper level and more meaningful, more artistic. And, you know, how are, how are we putting down this drug, you know, and arresting people for it and all that we, you know that's a whole nother story but you know how, how are people looking down on this when you know we could it's 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 a it's a miracle drug you know it's it's creating art that otherwise wouldn't be there um you know allowing somebody to create art that, that otherwise wouldn't be there so that's that's how i viewed it and um as time went on um it's, it's funny, I, I didn't, it, it took me a long time to make a connection between LSD and rock music. Um, okay. I, can't, I can't exactly explain why, probably because I wasn't doing much, much research about it. I didn't have friends who knew much about it. And um, I think I came from a neighborhood that, you know, didn't really dabble in a lot of drugs. And, you know, again, the 80s is, you know, drugs are bad, say no to drugs. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I just never made, it, it took a long time to make the connection. So as time went on, uh, an interesting thing happened. You know, uh, I gravitated towards people who enjoyed smoking marijuana and listened to the same music as me. And, you know, that's how important it was to me. Um, Which that, probably you know, made your parents very happy. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, my, my parents, you know, if you want to get into that, it just, it, we'll get a little sidetracked here. But my parents, and this, I presume, played some sort of role in all this um were uh you know at the age so so put it this way my friends parents some of them probably 50 percent of them were hippies and the other half were not so that's the age group i guess that we're in you know and so my parents happen to be people who were just not hippies right. didn't understand the hippies um my, you know, not my dad was a Democrat, um, but but still not a liberal guy at all. Very conservative and really just never had it, never smoked pot. Neither my mother tried it once, mm -hmm. claims she got sick or something like that. My father never, ever supposed to. Um, my, my father n never, never, ever tried it in his life, never would. Um, and if you if you even brought it up. It was, uh, you know, he'd get angered about it. Yeah, you know, that's that's not what people, you know, that's ruin your life kind of thing. So that's right. where my parents were coming from. Oh, that my I, parents said that too. That's not what people do. It's not what people do, but <laughs> <laughs> you quickly learn people do it. Um, but yeah, and they, you know, all this. Hey, buddy, what's up? No. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm surrounding myself with people who, who you know, see the value, I want to say, mm -hmm. of getting high. Because I knew other kids who were just, you know, sort of bad kids who smoked pot. And, right. you know, that's a different story, mm -hmm. you know. But, the, you know, I, I, I found some 
kids who were, you know, I, I was, I was, uh, I, 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 uh, I was placed into some advanced classes and in, in, you know, junior high and high school back in the day. And the, you know, my friends in those classes were very few and far between who did smoke pot and the ones who did had this value that I did, that this is, you know, something great. They love to listen to the same music that I did, mm -hmm. um, you know, while smoking pot and, you know, <laughs> saw a connection. And so, you know, some were musicians too. And so, you know, that's, this is, you know, I'm turning my environment into this thing. That's how important it is. Almost like a religion for me. And, you know, that's, right. so I, I was, I was uh, still no connection between LSD, no connection between hippies and, and rock and roll yet, because again, I'm living in the eighties. I know. What are you about, listening to at this time? I'm, I'm listening to whatever's on the radio, basically. Okay. Um, in the earlier stages, I'm listening to things that are coming out on MTV. It's, it, you know, that that's mm -hmm. I planted myself in front of MTV when it came out, and you know, just you know, whatever came on, I was I was I was listening to it, and it was, it was right. you know, interested in it. Um, it's and a much it's, different way of taking in media back then. You know, absolutely. a much different way of like consuming music. Absolutely. So if, so if you put yourself in my shoes and that's what I'm doing, that's how I'm being mostly exposed to music. I'm not seeing, you know, hippies on MTV. I'm not seeing any kind of psychedelic thing on MTV that at least I'm catching on to. So the, the connection still isn't there, although I'm seeing a huge connection in marijuana and music. So I'm, and I'm fascinated by that. And at some point I'm hanging out with these kids who one of them has uh, parents who are hippies. And mm -hmm. <laughs> it somehow I was oblivious to that too. I mean, this father looked like me. I, her father looked like me. And um, I'm still oblivious to this whole idea, you know, that, um, that somehow, you know, they're, they're hippies and that they've taken other drugs besides marijuana. I knew they smoked marijuana. But still, I don't know, maybe I thought they were hippies, but I just didn't know what that was yet. And um, her father caught us one time um, taking marijuana from them. Not me, she did. And, you know, not a big deal. He said, oh, don't take that. I've got some good stuff you guys would enjoy. And so he started giving us some, some marijuana. My other friends were going to, we lived close to New York City on the East Coast. So my other friends were going to New York City and like the worst neighborhoods to you know, buy dime bags. So he would, and he knew that. And he said, just take the, when you guys want it, just take this, you know? And he was growing it. And uh, mm. so it's, you know, I started to make the connection. This guy's a different guy, not like my father, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I really liked him. We had some pretty heavy conversations and, I remember, he, I remember him asking me, you know, what do I feel like when I, when I smoke marijuana? And I couldn't come up with the, I, with, with the words. And what, what came to me was um, I often feel like I'm watching myself. And, and he said, yeah, you know, and like we talked about that whole idea and he, it clicked for him. He knew what I was talking about, you know? So I, I was, you know, I, was, I, I felt some sort of connection to this guy. And it grew, and, and eventually he gave me a book called um, The Psychedelic Experience, which is by, you know, Ram Dass and Timothy Leary. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this, I didn't even know what the book was about, you know? It took me, I read it like three times until I started to make the connection, you know, that, that this is a book about how to take an, you know, an LSD experience, you know, an acid trip and, you know, have it go right and everything. And um, so I started saying to some of my friends, you ever hear of this book? No, nobody, nobody knows about it. Nobody knows who Timothy Leary is or anything, you know. Then I hear, then I start at some point listening to, to a classic rock station in New York. Mm -hmm. And I start hearing some really cool music that, you know, and I'm really into it. This one, I'm smoking marijuana now. Unlike the synth pop stuff that I was, you know, really involved with on MTV, this is like really psychedelic. You know, I didn't know it was psychedelic, but this is really having an interaction with how, you know, when I smoke weed, you know, it's a really sounding, you know, way more intense. I'm getting it a lot more when I smoke. So there's, there's an even bigger connection, right? And so I'm really into classic rock. I'm figuring it, 
figuring out it comes from an older time from the 60s 70s and um and i'm starting to hear something you know stuff like the moody blues and you know i'm listening to more of the beatles you know mm. and uh you know more more psychedelic stuff there's a thing on called psychedelic sunday and that's the first time i hear the the term psychedelic i don't know what it means but you know i'm really into this music and i hear the moody blues and i hear um legend of a mind timothy leary is dead and i say, oh my god these guys know who timothy leary is <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's heard of him. and then like all of a sudden things started to click and i started you know there's no internet and i started to go to the library and i started learning about it and hippies and the connection and i read about kent state and all this kind of i mean it was a, a flood of information and i'm like i really felt like i found what i'm looking for you know and i can't wait to take lsd and see how you know what this drug does and see what it does with music because i mean this is really my main focus is how are drugs going to play a role in expanding my mind to tap into something that I other wouldn't that I otherwise wouldn't even know existed that would help me create music in a in a bigger and better way and you know or at least different you know um, and so finally time goes on and you know a friend of mine says hey a friend has acid blah 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 should we take it um, and I, and I'm like, please, yeah, you know, we've been talking about this, let's do it, you know? And um, so we do it, it's four of us. My friend's father went away, he was d divorced. And so my, he was away for a couple of days and my friend had the apartment to himself and the four of us said, let's camp out there for the night and we'll take acid. And, um, and uh, well, there was no music involved at all. It took on a whole different thing. I forgot that there, I was even supposed to be connecting this to music, but mm -hmm. it was a, a seriously intense experience for me. And I, to, to this day, I'm pretty sure maybe a little bit more intense than, than the other three guys in the room. Although, you know, you never could be totally sure. I know that they had a, uh, a very enlightening experience too, but, but, it was an, exp an overwhelming experience for me. And it really only took one hit. Um, and it was for me, I remember being to a point where, okay, I was prepared, you know, from reading the, you know, the, uh, the, the book, The Psychedelic Experience. And I was prepared to sort of let my mind go, you know, and, you know, not, not fight anything that was happening. And that's what I was doing. I was going with the flow so much so that I feel like I was like sort of flailing in the wind with this whole thing during the transition of it coming on. And um, to the point where I don't know that any of us were able to even communicate with each other or if that was just my perception of what was going on. But I feel like there was a whole sort of like almost like psychotic babbling going on and nobody able to really say what was happening to them until one of my friends said like you know out of this whole chatter i remember just sort of hearing him and you know he leaned into me and said i must have said something to make him say no we really can communicate if you just like take it seriously for a second we really can communicate and concentrate <laughs> and i all of a sudden was like Whoop, you're right you know this is chaotic and crazy but this is an easy thing to harness and, you know, the, the power of and, and take control of and recognize what's happening. And what is happening is we are in a completely different realm now, you know, a completely different world. So I was, I was, that's how I was feeling. I was blown away. Like I was, there was no doubt that I was thinking I was starting to hallucinate. You know, I was, I was fascinated by what my brain could do, you know, and I had already understood, you know, from reading about it and everything that this isn't really the drug so much having some sort of, you know, drug effect, but this is, you know, the key to open up, you know, doors to your mind and, and boy, was I there. I mean, it, I was fascinated and the trip lasted a good eight hours 
And that was really my first experience. And again, we, we never ended up listening to music. We just sat around, we talked. At one point we, we took a walk at night. Um, and then uh, my other friend who was uh, a, uh, considered himself a singer and a lyricist um, was, had a very similar experience in terms of like, hey, I'm, I'm getting this whole idea of drugs and music. And I, I could see where this could go, even though we never even thought about it. I really want to, you know, try taking acid and, you know, listen to music next time we do this, you know? So I was like, yes, I'm ready. Let's do it. That turned into somebody saying, here's some acid, go to a Grateful Dead show. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know. You cut me off if we get to if I get too long winded. I know it's only a, an hour show or something. <laughs> I mean, we could take our notes. It's just I have themes. I should start taking notes. <laughs> I'm, I'm noticing themes, so yeah, keep, you're good. Um, and so I'm going to a show where you know I have no idea what the Grateful Dead are. Um, I think that they're. I, my cousins gave me a tape. I knew they were into them, but they never told me about any connection to drugs, of course. And um, they gave me Shakedown Street on cassette. And I, you know, I knew like Casey Jones and, and you know, Shakedown and Truck. And I thought I was going to see some sort of country disco band from the 60s, you know? And now I'm, so I'm like, I'm, again, I'm, I'm in this, this realm of like, I've got to find music that like, you know, I've got to find people that know I'm still back in like the marijuana thing, right? So I'm like, I hear certain things and like, I'm listening to the new Robert Plant album that came out, let's say, right? And I hear like something that blows my mind when I'm smoking a joint and listening to it. I'm like, whoa, did you hear that guitar line? It's like, it came from the right speaker to the left. And I'm like, Robert Plant must smoke pot. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, you know, this is where I'm at. I'm going back and I'm like trying to research. Do these guys know anything about drugs? And now start the things about LSD start coming up. And somehow I still haven't made the connection to the Grateful Dead or that like, you know, a lot of it was like, you know, this person took LSD once and, you know, I'm, I'm not really getting that it's a major thing yet. Mm -hmm. And, and it wasn't until I go to see the Grateful Dead in 1988 in Madison Square Garden and I took acid and I mean, I, I'm like, I'm talking to people and I'm like thinking I'm the only person that took acid. My, my friend and you guys got to hear about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I, then that turns into, you know, people just coming up to me and saying, what, what did you take tonight? And I'm like, what? Is it that obvious? Can you tell? You know, and they're like, no, everybody takes, you know, takes on the radical bed show. So, you know, it's like, this is blowing my mind. And, you know, eventually they're doing drums in space and it's just, you know, the quadraphonics around Madison Square Garden, you know, there's speakers behind me and I'm hearing crazy sounds and I'm like, oh, this is the psychedelic experience that I've been looking for in the connection to music. This isn't like Robert Plant smokes pot and has a, you know, guitar line that goes from one speaker to the other. This is the full blown thing. And I, Oh, and I'll tell you also, I was involved in this idea that, um, you know, I, I wanted to find music that was, you know, drug oriented. That's all I knew about, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the connection between whatever drugs and, and music. And um, all most of what I was finding was like the Moody Blues, um, Cream and, you know, um, you know, uh, Pink Floyd. So British bands, you know, British psychedelic. That's all I really knew. That's all they really played on the radio, the Beatles. I was interested in finding something that, you know, a band, an American band that was still around, that wasn't just a throwback to what they mm -hmm. did. I was watching, I, I saw the Moody Blues and, you know, they had a, they had a Hammond organ and, you know, everything was very 60s. I, I loved it, but I was looking for something that was modern. I was really interested in synthesizers at the time, like I said, you know, and I knew that that could create psychedelic effects. And so, you know, stumbling on the Grateful Dead the way I did, you know, just had all of those elements. You know, Jerry was 
you know, they're all using MIDI guitars and, you know, triggering synthesizers from their various instruments, drums and everything. And I mean, it, it was mind blowing. And I was just like, this is it. This is where I'm at. Um, that friend of mine and I go back and we're, we're, we're in a different world. And I remember waking up the next day, not like the time before and being like, I still feel like something, you know? And my friend said, I think this is going to be permanent. <laughs> and yeah, we felt like we had tapped into some outer edges of our mind that were now, you know, going to be there for the rest of our lives. And, you know, we took it seriously and we now saw the connection and we started, um, like I said, he was a lyricist. And I started music, writing music to his lyrics. We started doing this on a daily basis. I, I went out and I bought a, a four track recorder mm. and we were laying down various instruments and writing songs and putting songs together. And what we consider to be psychedelic music. Um, and most of what we learned was, you know, from seeing the Grateful Dead and, you know, listening to, you know, other psychedelic music. We were both really into the Beatles as well. And, you know, got really into Sgt. Peppers and Revolver after that. And yeah, and we just, you know, we saw such a value. And, um, you know, he went out, I thought we both saw such a value. And you know he went on to just become a regular dude, and um, but I'm I'm obsessed. You know I I'm, I stay obsessed with this whole thing, and so so that's that's what it was for me. I, I and then I eventually, as time goes on, I start experimenting with um, taking LSD and and playing music in front of a live audience, um, and that for me changes just everything. I'm I'm you know. Um, again, I'm, I'm tapping into, you know, these, these outer edges of the mind, as I say, that, you know, I'm able to, you know, come up with these creative ideas and I'm, I'm able to color the sound with the various synthesizers I'm using in such creative ways that I know if this is, this is very real. I know I would never have been able to have done w without taking LSD and without uh, tapping into those parts of my brain. That's where it's at, Ray. Okay, cool. I just wanted to make sure you were actually stopping to this. <laughs> I can keep going. <laughs> um, well, you know, what's interesting is what you were saying, the difference between the, this balance between going with the flow, yeah. which perhaps you learned from reading the psychedelic experience. It sounds like you were better prepared than many uh, yeah. from having done that work. And then, so the going with the flow balanced with your friend saying, wait, if you actually take a moment and focus and ground and get serious, you can communicate. And so it kind of seems like when you're then saying, so going from, I'm just looking at a Scott who's gone from not being able to hold a conversation to a Scott who's able to hold a conversation with a group of musicians with a musical instrument in front of a live audience. You're absolutely right. There's no doubt about it. There's that connection. And I think that's what I learned from the Grateful Dead and was fascinated by immediately. I said, these guys, you know, are, could be, you know, as out of it as I am, or so seemingly as out of it as I am, where I can't even communicate. And they're, they're at the same point, maybe, in their brain, or have been at times when they've created this music, yet have been able to turn around and, and harness that chaos and turn it, you know, design it you know you use it to design something that is that is um you know they're putting form to chaos i guess really mm -hmm. and that is, that is just like you say what was happening with that that whole first experience of mine that i was in a chaotic moment and somebody said yeah it's chaos but you could you could control it you know mm -hmm. and so and, uh, yeah so I think that's a really interesting theme because, you know, the idea of surrender and go with the flow is so big. And, you know, the, I suppose on the flip side, you know, people do talk about grounding and centering a lot, you know, finding balance. And that's, that's a, a really interesting example of it. The other thing that I thought was interesting is kind of the experience of starting to find camaraderie and finding people who understand you 
you know, which maybe starts with your friend's father. Um, it was actually one of my friend's father took us to our first Grateful Dead show. And he was a psychologist with a float tank in his basement. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that guy got some stuff. You know, he yeah. understood <laughs> He understood some things. He got that. Uh, um, so, you know, will you maybe riff on that a little bit? This idea of like having experiences, not thinking maybe you're the only one, not really knowing that there's a community out there to moving into. It's like, oh, my God, now I'm a leader in the community. Yeah. Yeah, I sometimes think about how um, how maybe people who who experimented with the psychedelic drugs or maybe even came about them accidentally, you know, in in um, in earlier times, um, you know, how they must feel if they're the only one that's experienced this mind alteration and um nobody else has you know it's not something you could easily describe in words to what's happening to you and I, you know it must kind of feel frightening and like like you've gone crazy you know you're in a world you're thinking um i mean it, you know that's what's most important about it is that it put it puts you in a different consciousness it makes you think a different way it makes you use your brain in a completely different way and if that's if that's happening and that's able to happen and you never knew it before and no one around you ever knew it before then that, that, that there's an, an element of that that must be a little bit frightening not like haha i know more than you guys i'm enlightened i think it would be more like wow there's something going on that you'll never understand you'll never understand what just happened and that kind of thing you know, I could be wrong. I mean, maybe it's just, maybe it is the opposite, but that's the way I presume it might be. And I think the, the opposite of, of that in a way is, um, and the, the joy that people get out of this is that just like we we're saying, you know, you, know you, you get it, you get it too, all of you get it. And it, you know, it, you know, that's, that's the basis of, of being a human is, you know, socialization and community. We need each other. Um, we can't build bridges or go to the moon, you know, just, you know, on an individual basis. We need each other to do things in advance in society. So I, I think that's the real root of what being human is in a lot of ways. And so naturally we're gonna feel joy when we're uniting for, you know, with, you know, the, in a common, on a common ground, you know, the, the group conscious, if you will, if we all start thinking the same way and going towards the same goal um, and we're all getting it. And, and um, that's something that really blew me away about the Grateful Dead. I had seen a bunch of concerts before that, um, but this was the only concert I had ever seen where the Grateful Dead would come to what seemingly seems like a magical moment I mean, what's happening? You know, maybe, maybe it's getting louder. It's getting more intense, more energetic. I don't, you know, all these magical things that are happening that come together at the right moment, and you realize you're not the only person getting goosebumps because everybody else is going woo at the same time. You visually and see it, and you you hear it, the people reacting, and you know, you you say, yeah, this is we're we're behaving together. We're creating something together. And of course, the Grateful Dead are hearing and seeing it and they're reacting off of each other. And it's just, you know, it's, it's that, that the, the group conscious. I think that's what we're built to do is gravitate towards that thing. And that's what we're going to get enjoyment out of because it's important for us to move along evolutionarily. Right. And so where does that put you as sort of a torchbearer, perhaps, you know, as sort of a, a next gen, you know, you're playing this music and you're kind of carrying this message on and, you know, allowing other people, you know, starting to tell other people that they're not alone and that these values are shared. So, I, so <clears throat> what comes apparent to me is that as time goes on is I'm, I'm different, even in, even in these, even in this new world of mine, I'm different. Right. I've got my friend who writes lyrics and he's into it. But the other two guys do their thing. You know, they're baseball players and whatever, you know, and um, 
And, you know, then my friend, the lyricist just, you know, starts getting into real estate eventually or whatever, you know, and, um, <laughs> you know, now I have just a, just a friend or two who's serious about music mm-hmm. and, and, um, maybe they're not really, they, they didn't even go through the LSD experience as, as heavily as I am. They're not so interested in it as they are in, you know, maybe a different style of music at, at this point or whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm different. I'm becoming the only guy who's like really into the Grateful Dead. I've got other friends who are very into the Grateful Dead and seemingly get a lot of what I'm getting, but they don't play music, right? Mm. They don't, they haven't grown up playing piano and, you know, doing what I did. And, you know, eventually I took lessons. Eventually I went to music school um, for college and, um, you know, really, really became involved in, in studying it. And so, so I'm, di- I'm feeling different. I know I'm different, you know, I'm the only guy that, you know, really plays an instrument out of everybody, out of all of my friends. And if, if others do, it's a hobby, you know, this is my life. This is what I do. I've, I've, I'm obsessed, you know? And mm-hmm. so, so if that's me, then, you know, how am I going to be the torchbearer? Well, I feel like, you know, knowing what I know, and then, you know, going to see as many Grateful Dead shows as I could after that, and always taking LSD um, when, I, when I saw it. And <clears throat> under, you know, understanding, you know, the scales that they're playing in and their, their use of dynamics and starting to get what each individual, is per, which each individual uh, instrumentalist is doing to create this truly unique sounding music. I mean, you know, it's rock and roll. It's psychedelic rock and roll, it's American rock and roll, but there's something about it that is so unique. I think everybody agrees. You know, when you're, if, when you're flipping through the dials on the radio back in the day, you know, you, you pass a Grateful Dead song, for, you, know, you instantly recognize it as the Grateful Dead. You know, when I was in college and you'd walk by people's dorms, you know, you'd instantly recognize, even if you didn't know what song it was, you'd instantly recognize Jerry's guitar lines as you're passing by that or, you know, being the Grateful Dead. So there's something so unique about it. And I was able to, with my knowledge and you know, my continued study, I was able to figure out what they were doing. And I wanted nothing more than to give people the experience that I was having on some level, um, whether, you know, outside, you know, especially after Garcia was gone and it was a different Grateful Dead. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wanted to be able to have people sit down and get the same feelings, the same goosebumps that I got um, during those shows. And and I felt that, you know, with my knowledge, I could hopefully recreate to, to, you know, to a close enough idea, um, you know, what was happening. And so, I don't know. Is that is that torch bearing? <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make it too heavy handed, but you answered it beautifully. I mean, that's that's that makes a lot of sense. It's really I'm, I'm just in my head picturing the Venn diagram. Yeah. Of, you know, the, like the love for the music. Yeah. And the ability to actually play music. Yeah. You know, it's actually like a real thin sliver. And then perhaps even like the fortitude to stick it out because you know, apparently being a working musician is sometimes tougher than at other times. Sure. Yeah. And kind of, and especially in these times, which I want to get to, but I also kind of want to hit on the note, you know, you mentioned Kent State and you mentioned the kind of the atrocity that is the war on drugs and how interesting it is that sort of, you know, turning into to you know using this using these substances recognizing that they're super beneficial and very healing and very inspiring um that sort of the 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 cat is out of the bag and that the more that we have kind of come together and found places like grateful dead shows and other things like that where we see all of the positive benefits that there's now this sort of sea change happening in culture and, you know, hopefully, you know, people are being arrested less, um, you know, every once in a while, people are getting released out of jail. Is there any sort of like other thoughts about that or about like activism or about like what you'd like to see for the future? Yeah, uh, 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, some of that goes back to what we talked about with creating community and the group conscious mm -hmm. and everything, um, gravitating towards uh, like-minded people. But I'm, I'm going to go back to the first time that I tried it. And one thing I left out that's important is that um, not only did I recognize that it, you know, gave me the ability to, you know, tap into a bigger part of my brain that would literally make me a better mu artist. Mm -hmm. um, but what, um, what we did for the, for the, probably the last quarter of our eight hour trip, um, we sat down in a circle Indian style and just kind of discussed life mm -hmm. and, um, I mean, things that we never thought about and we're, we're having this group conscious between the four of us of what do you guys think about the death penalty that's awful isn't it that we, you know somebody would say i have the authority to kill you that is terrible and i mean there was no like well you know let me think about this no it was like immediately that is so terrible how did we never even think about this before you know and so that's just one example and that went on for two hours you know and all of it was you know, what, what most people, unless you're evil would say good, you know, was good. We were discovering good and the good in us and what, what it's, you know, what, what's right and what's wrong. Um, and um, so not only did it make me a better artist, but it made, made me a better person and made all four of us a better person. I, I truly believe that anybody who takes it it will make you a better person. It'll make you a gooder person. <laughs> In other words, you know, someone who's gonna, um, you, you know, you, you're gonna, uh, you know what I'm saying. Uh, I know what you're saying and you're reminding me of, it's either Terrence McKenna or Bill Hicks quote. Um, that'd be a fun game show. We should play that game show on this podcast. Who said this, Bill Hicks or Terrence McKenna? Yeah, because that, that could change the context of everything. <laughs> um, where he said, you know, drugs aren't illegal because a kind and protective mommy government is trying to save you from yourself. They're illegal because they don't want you thinking about things like that. Yeah, I, I, I have a small recollection that might be Terrence McKenna. Yeah, I think it's Terrence um, yeah, um, I think there's that. Yeah, I think there's that on on the surface. I, don't, I, th I unfortunately think that people who don't take LSD or never have don't have the capacity to understand that to its fullest degree. Um, mm -hmm. I think they're busy. They're too busy saying it makes people crazy, you know, so, you know, to think that way is crazy. Um, I think that the that people on government level um, especially back during the beginning of, you know, trying to understand what LSD was. I think people were getting hip to the idea that at least, and right. Timothy Leary certainly explained it that way, that, you know, the, these kids who were taking LSD weren't going to be too hip on war and killing people. <laughs> and so I think they got that to, to a certain degree, but n never really could understand how powerful it really is, you know. Right. Well, I think that wasn't that part of the war where the war Nixon's war on drugs started, because you couldn't arrest somebody just for being a, a leftist, peace-loving hippie, but you could arrest them for weed. Absolutely. There's no question about it. But does that mean that he understood that somebody would take it and say and see through what he was involved in, which was, you know, just this this other form of you know, shallow life, so to speak. Um, well, see, that's the thing is like, you say things like you think it would make anybody a better person. Um, yeah. I think that there are, we're, we're not accounting for sociopaths. Dan, that's hang on one second, my battery's dying. So I'm gonna oh my try goodness. and figure out a way to make this work. I got <laughs> technical support. All right, so while I have you guys, I just want to give a shout out to Josh. This came in the mail today, this tie-dye. Josh of Barefoot Laser Tie-Dyes sent me this tie-dye, so I figured I'd put it on and just give him a shout out. So this show is brought to you by Barefoot Laser Tie-Dyes. Um, he has an Etsy store. Um, 
So my Did problem you is it out? you now, unfortunately. <laughs> oh my goodness, check. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. If I get close enough, I could hear you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry this happened. <laughs> No, it's okay. We run we 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 run a tight ship of fools. <laughs> Indeed. So my next question was so psych psychopaths. It's like there are people I think that have different mental and emotional structures. That you know, there's some evidence that says LSD makes a psychopath a better psychopath. But if like somebody doesn't have a heart, it won't give them one. What do you think of that? that even if somebody so if somebody doesn't have a heart it will give them one is that what you said it, or it won't? won't it won't okay yeah i think that's true i mean you know i'm i'm always my first feeling is you know lsd could you know save the world um can you hear me okay by the way yes okay um and that you know if everybody took it everybody would be a better person i i think i even really absolutely verbalized that mm -hmm. um but yeah, the truth is, is that I'm I'm sure there are people who, and I've heard stories um, of people who uh, don't respond that way. I, I actually know somebody who uh, was from me, um, really liked to take a lot of cocaine, um, mm -hmm. really liked to, um, you know, just was uh, maybe a, a less educated, um, probably less intelligent, and, um, you know, really coming from sort of the other side of life than me. Uh, a, a big mean dummy, of... a big mean dummy. What's that? A big mean dummy. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and engage in some sort of criminal behavior every once in a while, the whole, the whole thing. Uh, he took, his parents got divorced when he was younger. He told me the story, I wasn't around for it. Mm -hmm. um, he took it really hard, didn't know how to deal with it, decided to take a, a tent trip of acid and, decided he'd go to the graveyard at some point in the height of his trip and just kick over gravestones. Okay. So, so, you know, there's that, I mean, there's, you know, you're right. I mean, if, if there's something else going on in you and you, you know, it's going to take something more, I think, to, you know, to, to tap into um, that, that good heart, you know, right. which I do believe everybody probably does have in them. Um, but, and, and the, the answer to getting there is, is love. Those people need love. Those people who've never had love, never, never find it in yes. themselves. So Nixon just needed love. Nixon needed love. Yeah. And that's always, that's really another tough thing because it's like, how do you give Nixon love without him doing, you know, without being sent to war, being thrown in prison or being assaulted or things like that. You know what I mean? It's like, how do we take care of ourselves being like bleeding hearts? Like, you know, I'm sure that like bleed, if you've taken enough LSD, like bleeding heart is not even a, a metaphor. Like it's like you, you see it happening. Um, and so how does one love like that while remaining safe? You know, you're a dad, you're a husband and a father, and it's like you, there's a particular amount of safety that has to happen for your family. Okay, is that better? That's perfect. Okay, great. So, okay, one more time, and I'm so, so sorry. We were talking about the balance between the dichotomy of going with the flow and mm -hmm. being serious and focused, and that we have to sort of live both of those things. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is like, how do we be supremely loving and open to, to the people who need it the most, Nixon, your friend who kicks over gravestones, while still having healthy boundaries for our material need for safety. Right, okay, so it's, it's, it's easy with my son, you know, um, it's, it's just all natural. Um, I can love him, I could be as vulnerable as I want um, because, um, he's a two year old, you know, and, and, yep. you know, anything that he does, that's, that might be considered mean or, or harmful or whatever. It's just, he's, a, he's learning about life and, I, and I'm, you know, it, it feels so natural for me to just shower him with love and, you know, mm -hmm. help him, you know, help him through life in just that way. And I, you could see a direct relationship that, you know, the more love I give him, the more he wants to be around me and do the right thing. And, you know, mm -hmm. you can see what you can see with my dog, even, you know, so, but it does become harder with adults. Um, yes. 
and it becomes harder with friends and, and even family members who are adults. Um, and, uh, you know, life gets more complicated, I guess. The brain develops, you know, these defense mechanisms and, you know, when people fantasize about things that are happening, I'm guilty of it, I'm sure everybody is. Um, you think things are happening that, are, that aren't, you think somebody thinks one way and somebody doesn't. There seems there's a, a bigger breakdown in communication as people get older and, you know, so it, it does become more difficult. So the, the, I, I don't know if I have an answer for that, unfortunately. I kind of almost feel like that's the case is if, if people don't have people in their lives to love them when they're growing up, when they're younger, then it's at least going to be a huge challenge for right. them and in, in life later on. And it might be, it might be too late. There, there are some people out there that are amazing that mm -hmm. who will go to all sorts of lengths to love strangers yeah. to help them out. And we're very lucky to have people like that, but they're, they're few and far between, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, if, fortunately I do feel like a lot of them are in our community, you know, I've yeah. seen, amazing acts of kindness, you know, in, in Grateful Dead community that, um, you know, I'd put up against like any kind of new age religious community. Yeah. You know, it's just like, it's just a real rootsy kind of care that is almost like kind of without pretension and almost like, you know, like the psychedelics make it so obvious. Right. You know, it's not like, oh, maybe like I'll have gain the favor of the guru if I'm ethical. It's like, no, you have to be ethical because you've seen what happens over the course of 10,000 lifetimes if you're not. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which brings me yeah. to another question. I, I, I wanted to ask you this. You know, we were talking about realizing things, you know, having these moments of realizations under, under the influence. Was, was there, and you spoke about a few of them in the early journeys, were there any in the later journeys when you were just like, Oh, right. Duh. When you were like wrong about something and you realized it or something, there was some sort of kind of aha moment. Um, you know, it's, it's not that long ago that, um, that I, that I actually took um, mushrooms was the last time that I took it. And I think that that's, that's something that's, Amazing. I went through this phase for a long time where I decided I wasn't going to take any psychedelics anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, well, that, that's a complicated story that I don't know if we have time for, but it was a lot of it was causing me anxiety and I tossed it up to, hey, you know, I've gotten the, the most out of this that I possibly could. But then mm -hmm. later on, I, I, you know, I, I started taking it again after many years. And um, and there's, there's no doubt that every time I take it, one, one thing I realized, and especially recently, that, that if I take a psychedelic, even if I feel like something didn't happen during that trip, you know, that was enlightening, um, days later, maybe, a week later, I may say something like, you know, I think, I've, I, I have a, do, a different viewpoint on something and I'm gonna you know, try and work my life around that. I, you know, this is important. Um, and you know, I sometimes wonder how that could be. And I think what's happening is again, we're, we're changing our consciousness and it's for you know, seemingly for whatever, four to eight hours, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, but you've been there, you know? You've, you've been there, you, you, you know, your, your mind has been unlocked. You get, you know, you walk away getting that, you know, there's that, you know, life is filtered, you know, mm -hmm. and um, that there's a way to experience it without a filter. And so, so sure, a week later, you could, you could, you know, your, your mind is still sort of in some sort of, uh, you know, it's been there. So it's, it's able to, you know, it's processing things a little bit differently over that week, let's say even though it may not seem that way. Yeah, I'm getting the sense of like more breathing room. It's like all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, can, I can get so entrenched in my beliefs and like my 
thoughts about you know what happened and what needs to happen and then it's like well what if you were just like a little bit kinder and a little bit more creative maybe things would work out better for you it's like oh yeah maybe yeah <laughs> shocker yeah really yeah well i mean a lot of people don't have time to think that way you know right mm -hmm. <laughs> So what are you working on these days, you know, in this um, post live music world? Yeah. So I'm, uh, I've been, I, you know, lucky, I guess, you know, to uh, been able to, I've been doing live streams and um, mm -hmm. most importantly, it's just keeping my, my sanity, you know, right. it's giving me that connection to an audience that I, you know, is really important for what I do. I can't mm -hmm. hear them or see them. But somehow I, I feel that they're out there and there is this immediacy of, you know, them reacting to what I'm doing right now, right here and now. And okay. so I, I need that in my life. And it uh, brings me a lot of joy to be able to do it. Luckily, um, everybody's been really supportive of the music community and all the musicians who are doing this. And we've okay. set up universally sort of a thing called, uh, you know, virtual tip jar. Everyone puts out their right. PayPal links and, We've been getting donated. Yeah, you know, you do doing the same sort of thing. Oh, we have to um, get um, Brian. Are you watching? Will you put Will you put Scott's tip jar up? <laughs> and people have been, you know, generous enough to donate. You know, people who could. And, you know, that's really been getting me through that. Combined with, uh, uh, I have a small recording uh, set up here, so I've been uh, working on recordings with people, uh, basically online. You know, uh, virtually. So, oh, right on. and bring, you know, bringing in some money that way. So that's the stuff that's been paying my bills and has been, you know, keeping me involved in music. Cause uh, one thing about music is it's not like riding a bike. It's uh, it goes away if you don't keep doing it. So, right. Yeah. Oh, which reminds me, I do, you know, we'll probably have to share this with Johnny Provo. Oh, Johnny Provo. Cool. <laughs> I didn't know you know him. <laughs> um, Johnny Provo played at my wedding. No kidding. Because my my wife's aunt lives in Rhode Island and we got married and they have a nice place out there on the water. And I typed Grateful Dead cover band into Rhode Island into Google. And it was like four mediocre bar bands and then this one band that had like stand-up bass and banjo and like a real nice acoustic cover i was like oh that's my vibe and it was him are we lose you again no sorry i think it's uh sorry um yeah he's uh he's a fun guy um i i played in a band with him for a long time actually mm -hmm. for a couple of years i think um Doing Grateful Dead stuff, of course. But yeah. yeah, that's funny. It's such a small world. <laughs> Indeed, it's a, it's a small world. And yeah, they were great. They were really sweet. They let me sit in on a song. You know, oh, cool. I'm not I'm not good, but they sort of propped me up. It was very very nice. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so hey, Johnny. <laughs> um, Johnny. <laughs> my other thought, you know, there's this this couple of shows. You know, we're talking about sort of like you know, freedom and LSD and conversational music. There were a couple of shows at the Great Room that I don't know if you were playing at where they had the liquid light shows on the walls and you guys weren't playing songs. You were okay. just kind of going oh, for it. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, that's um, uh, Telstar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a fun thing. So you're um, in Tel you were in Telstar. Yes, yeah. Dude, those shows that was so fun. I think they I think they may have done a couple of them without me or at least one, but yeah. The okay, well, very, we'll very assume fun. that I was at the one with you. All right. But yeah, it's <laughs> great. I mean, we we go out there um and there's there's literally sometimes Phil will say something like let's start off with a theme and you know in D major or whatever. But that's it, you know? And it's right. just whatever happens happens and it's just we're following each other, you know, as soon as uh -huh. I think I'm following Phil, he's following me. And then, you know, you start creating something in that realm. And it's just, it's, it's fun, man. It's really cool. Yeah. Cause on one hand we do sort of like to sing along, you know, we kind of like choruses and verses on one hand, but on another hand, like whatever that was really hit the spot. Yeah. I, yeah. 
I think it's really cool. Um, it's, um, I, I like what you're saying because I, I'm glad I'm not only doing that because uh, I also love, you know, to be able to find melody and everything. And I think that's the beauty of the Grateful Dead is again, the, um, the chaos mixed in with form, you know, and the way they use it. Um, all that chaos eventually becomes beautiful melodies in the end, you know, um, mm -hmm. a Stella Blue or something, you know. So I think that's important. But, um, and so, so that's sort of, we tried to sort of incorporate that, but without any kind of structure at all. So we right. get totally out there um, and, you know, not in any kind of key, not in any kind of time signature and then eventually bring it back to some sort of melody where we're playing in the same key. Right. But that, I don't think it was ever even verbalized. We just sort of knew that was important. It reminds me a little bit of the Circle Around the Sun album, Interludes for the Dead. Sure, yeah. Which, yeah, there's a, a lot of that going on where you, you, know, you, think, you, you think they're giving you a melody that you could grasp onto all of a sudden. And uh, yeah, it's pleasing in some sort of way. Yeah, I mean, that pairs really nicely with psychedelics as well. It's also nice yes. that it's long. It's on the longer side. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Well, yeah, Telstar is definitely with psychedelics in mind, for sure. Right, probably in, a, in more than one way, so I'm guessing. Yes, definitely, yeah. <laughs> so any other things? So how do people get lessons with you? I don't give lessons, I'm afraid to say. So oh, wait, I thought I heard you say that. Oh, I thought I thought I heard you say that you did. Um, oh no, sorry. I've been recording with people. Got it. So Got it. so people have been um, more or less like some some people put it together an album and they decide it needs an organ track on it, and so oh, they'll send send me an MP3 of their rough mix of what they have so far. I'll mm -hmm. lay down my lines and email it back to them. It's pretty pretty awesome modern technology. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so any sort of like last thoughts, things that are like burning desires, as I would say, in the rooms of AA, any sort of thing that you really feel like you need to deliver to the people? Yeah. Um, you know, all this talk, I, I will say there's, there's an added benefit. I think people talk a lot about mushrooms and, you know, it's, you mentioned it, that, you know, it's uh, um, healing effects. I and mean, I think a lot of people are aware by now that um, it has a healing effect on, on people's depression. Um, and I think that's something that I could relate to. I could see that that's a very real thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I generally feel better after I take it for a long extended amount of time, whether it be weeks or months or whatever. Um, it puts me in a better, I don't like to use the word happy because that's never really the state that anybody should be going for in my mind but it keeps me content and that's i think that's what life is really about and um so i i don't have a problem de with depression but i could easily see how it re really would help people in that matter so i i can tell you that uh, based on my own experiences with it and what what i walk away from with it is that this is something that would be very medicinal in, in that matter and I mm -hmm. do hope that people research it more and are, are allowed to research it more. And I hope to see a lot of benefits from that because I have no, I think we all have known people who've suffered from depression, even if for, uh, even if it was for a short amount of time. And, um, you know, when it's clinical, when it's ongoing, um, I mean, that, that, that's awful for people. And I don't, I don't want to see that in anybody. And if there's a cure, for God's sakes, let's, let's do it, you know? Mm-hmm. Right on. Well, thank you so much for sharing thank your you. instrumental breakthroughs with us. I had a wonderful time doing this. It's great. You know, I, I let, you know, let, to go back to the group consciousness thing, you know, yeah. it's like, I feel like I have to share this kind of stuff with people and who okay. better to share it with in this community. It's awesome. Yeah, man. Well, that's sort of the idea behind this is, so I run integration circles and yeah. it's basically people who just had, who just tripped and they talk about what happened. Yeah. And a lot of the time, there are folks who need support, like they need, like they had maybe a tough time or an intense mm -hmm. experience and, you know, or sometimes it's, and not always, but sometimes. And what I have found is that the people who are having a great time don't come as much. Some do, but it's like, there's sort of, you know, how do we kind of elevate this conversation 
for people who are, like you said, happy or content. Yeah. You know, like, how do we get this conversation out at sort of like a high level? So it's not just like, dude, I got so messed up. Right. You know? Yeah. Well, you're doing do it. I think this is a great way to do it for sure. That's mm -hmm. very cool. And who better than to do it with than everybody's favorite rock and roll superheroes? Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's you. That's you. All right, man. Thank you so much. Thank you to Brian at Deadhead Land. Thank you to Skylar and Steve at Livestream Remote um, for managing the technical aspects. Uh, my name is Daniel. Uh, this has been Instrumental Breakthroughs. All the best. Many blessings. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks, Scott. <laughs>